So uh, there are certain specific imaging features which of certain uh, conditions, which is again from that paper we have written, l 2 hydroxyglutaric acidity, which is rare, maybe very rare in this part of the country. You can see the dendrite nucleus hyperintensity, and you can see the centripetal distribution, subcortical white matter involvement, and you can see the external capsule involvement, and they will present with uh, seizures, and their clinical outcome will be slightly be better than d 2 hydroxyglutaric acidity. So I'm not going to the details again. Looking at simple images, which are optimized for T2, can actually give you a lot of diagnostic information. Maple syrup urine disease, I thought it doesn't exist in India, but it do exist in India. And I've, Ashish, I've talked to Ashish Atre, he has actually shown me cases. And uh, it is actually uh, a, 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 is endemic in uh, some areas in Canada, especially in Waterloo. You can see that it's uh, because of high consanguinity, you get cases after cases coming from this area. So it is very important for us actually uh, to diagnose this in an in acute setting because you can actually, if you s miss the diagnosis, the chance of dialysing this patient and preventing further damage is lost and it can, could very well be a medical legal case in Canada. So uh, this is how you do that. It, this maple syrup use, urine disease is a myelin splitting disease. It actually affects areas where it's actually myelination has already happened. Happened. So in a neonate, you know that the posterior fossa is the first myelinate and the posterior dorsal tracts are the first myelinate other than the corticospinal tract. So it's a myelin splitting disease and myelin edema occurs in these cases. You can see this, the white matter of the cerebellum shows swollen. You can see these uh, posterior dorsal tracts are hyperindense, the corticospinal tracts are hyperindense. You can see spared areas there. You can see myelin edema over there, posterior limb of the inner capsule is swollen. You can see this restricted diffusion in the already myelinated which is dismyelinating now the, the, the posterior thalamic radiations, is the, which is the optic radiations, as well as in the posterior, I mean, the thalamus, as well as the corticospinal tract. If you see this, practically there is no other differential diagnosis other than maple syrup urine disease. So you can also do spectroscopy in this case. This is actually a case uh, given to me by Dr. Manoj from Trivandrum. So he has seen a case, similar case, uh, all the findings are similar. But if you look at the spectroscopy, you can see uh, these isoleucine, leucine, and valine, which is at 0.9, which is actually inverted peak. It is, it, there are several peaks you can actually observe between 0.9 and 1.3. You should be very careful. Don't, not all these things are just fatty acids or lactate. So they, you should be very, very careful. In this clinical setting, you can see that the NA is actually low. And you can see the lactate there, but you can also see uh, uh, said, what he called uh, that the isoleucine, leucine, and valine, which are the which are the amino acids which are uh, detected, which are, uh, which are getting accumulated in maple syrup urine disease. So you can actually see this. Again, other conditions like uh, neonatal brain with the perisylvian polymicrogyria, one of the differential is Selvager syndrome. They have large fontanelle. They will be very, very, uh, this is a complete paroxysmal disorder which is absence of all paroxysmal in enzymes. So they will not actually live longer. So you can actually diagnose uh, with the stippled patella and also look at uh, the other areas where the, the stippling of these epiphys I mean the, these uh, uh, epiphyseal things uh, uh, as well as uh, the, the, the patella. You can see that. You can do suggest uh, imaging like looking at the fondant of the patient or simple x-ray of the, the knee will actually cleanse the diagnosis. Molybdenum cofactor deficiency. I want to show you these cases because these are some of the differentials we see. We just by cortical edema we diagnose either either uh, diffuse hypoxic ischemia, insult, or some infections like uh, like HSV2 or uh, uh, the streptococcal infections with hemolytic streptococcal infections. There are other conditions, uh, metabolic conditions, molybdenum cofactor deficiency, which can be very well treated by, uh, by supplementing this cofactor, which is available readily. So uh, if you don't treat these cases, this is what the brain is going to end up with. It will, uh, it will look like end-stage PVL. You diagnose, even in this area, in stage you will not diagnose as a molybdenum cofactor deficiency, even if you diagnose, it's too late. So this is a differential diagnosis for end-stage hypoxic ischemic damage. So if you look at this spectrum, I want to show you this spectrum because I want to show you that this is not lactate. Lactate is a bad predictor of outcome, but this is lactate. You can see at 1.3 there is lactate, but at 1.1 there is another peak which is a doublet inverted, which is 1,2 propane diol. If you look at uh, neuroimaging clinics of North America, people, uh, neonates who are actually treated with uh, phenobarbitone, there is a preservative in it called 1,2-propanediol. They call it 1,2-propanediol or ethylene glycol. In, uh, Barkovich has actually written that article, but 1,2-propanediol is, is not ethylene glycol. It is propylene glycol. Ethylene glycol is a very toxic substance which is not used as a medicine. 1,2-propanediol or propylene glycol. You have to read it as propylene glycol. So uh, this is what it looks like. When the neonate is actually loaded with phenobarbitone, you can actually see this. 
especially when they throw seizures in a hypoxic ischemic insult. Sometimes they show only this, not this. And if you see lactate, it's a bad predictor. If you see one two propane diol, it's actually a metabolite of the the the, the of the tree uh, of the pharmacological. Uh, 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 treatment which is actually being given. So you should not confuse with, with these two peaks. One is at 1.3 inverted doublet, one is at 1.1. 1.1 you see 1 to propane diol or propylene glycol and 1.3 you see lactate. So if you see both, obviously you know that this patient is being treated with phenobarbitone, it's got a bad prognosis. Another very important thing I want you to do a spectroscopy in all children with global developmental delay in one single Voxel spectroscopy, a T144 or 135 in the left basal ganglia should be done. All cases of global developmental delay, you do 6,000 cases. One case you detect and you can treat it. This is a congenital creatine deficiency. Creatine transporter deficiency is a very, very rare disorder which will lead on to probably mild delay and global developmental delay. If you creatine supplement these patients, they will actually improve. And if you miss and could be only diagnosed with MR spectroscopy. It's a very rare condition. I've never seen, after coming back from Canada, I've done so many kids which I've when I referred for a global developmental delay, but I've never seen one. I meant to detect one. And, uh, but in Canada, they have actually shown three or cases in their entire uh, experience of more than 20 years. Mela syndrome, you can actually detect lactate, but where should we put the, put the voxel? If you put an infarcted area, lactate will be there. But if you see normal uh, looking gray matter if, or white matter, if you see lactate, it suggests that probably etiology may be melas in the correct clinical as well as in the, the, the MR imaging, imaging scenario. Menke's kinky hair disease, I want to show you some rare cases which, so that you can actually optimize. If you get a case, you can optimize your sequences. The conventional imaging show only delayed myelination, but you, all these cases you should do uh, TOF MR angiography. You can see these very tortuous skin vessels, and you can also order for a CT study of the, of the skull. You can see these Mormian bonds, which can also be seen in a lot of other conditions. If you see a combination, this is Menke's kinky hair disease. Coming to some of the cases we have done, not in neonates but in children, the Sturge-Weber syndrome, you can do NSW, I've already shown you, you can see these veins, abnormal developmental venous anomaly, you can also look at this pyloangiomatosis. But a better technique to detect, uh, look at pyloangiomatosis is post-contrast fat set imaging or even a post-contrast 3D flare. Even your T2 flare has got a T1 contrast. So you, if you inject contrast and do your 3D flare, you can see these enhancing pile vessels, pile angiomatosis better. Why to do a 3D instead of a 2D? So 2D has, can actually show a lot of flow, flow artifacts. Why I don't prefer a fat saturated T1 weighted images? For example, in this case, you, can, you, cannot actually, you can actually see a lot of veins which is getting enhanced. You can't actually differentiate whether this is the pile vessels or it's actually a cortical veins which is actually running in the pile location or in the subacranial space. So where if, whereas in the 2D flare, a lot of flow artifacts again can come. But in 3D, flow, 3D flare, you know that there will be very little flow artifacts. You can actually see these uh, flare enhancing lesions. So next time when you see uh, sturge syndrome or any case with the suspected subtle meningitis, after you doing your post-contrast 3D T1, you just run a 3D flare sequence if you have the capability. If you don't have a 3D capability, just do an axial flare sequence. We have actually used it for detecting very subtle aseptic meningeal inflammation, which can be very well picked up. So this is an interesting uh, technique. Colloid says you should do a T1 as well as T2 as well as diffusion, and you can actually do uh, the, the protein content of the colloid tissue is very important. Again, Kesha has extensively talked about n acetyl glucosamine and galactosamine in these neuroepithelial cysts, colloid-like cysts, and neuroentric cysts. Actually, we can't actually differentiate by them, but pathologically they could be differentiated. This turned out to be a uh, uh, colloid like cysts with the uh, ciliated columnar epithelium with no uh, globulate cells but the squamous metaplasia. And this is another case with the T1 hyperintensive. This turned out to be a uh, neuroendric cyst. We can see the globulate uh, like cells as well as ciliated columnar epithelium and also these uh, cells and uh, some areas of squamous lesions. So the, we have done in vitro spectroscopy and proved that this is due to N acetyl glucosamine and galactosamine. They are not N acetyl aspartate. So this is very interesting uh, research uh, which uh, we have done uh, sometime back which will be very useful uh, in detecting uh, the, the predicting the epithelium of these, these lesions. It's also been covered very well, so you can actually do diffusion tensor imaging, get the planar anisotropy, and you can see this planar anisotropy because of the, uh, the keratin sheets which are there. Coming to granulomas, 
you can do an enhanced sequence. The great question is asked uh, whether we can actually differentiate between tuberculous granulomas, cystic granulomas. Obviously, in all cases, you can't actually, but you can uh, see whether this is calcification or hemorrhage in some cases at least. For example, in the left hand system, you see these black dots there, and it's a perfect sphere, and you see this black face imaging with the perfect anilia stream, which is bright, which shows this is calcification. So, most of uh, I've interacted with so many people who are doing SWI, and everybody is concerned about differentiating calcium and hemorrhage may not be possible in all the cases. Racemocystis sarcosis, if you suspect you have to do a cis in, uh, sequence, it's the best sequence, you can actually detect them. And spectrosco um, spectroscopy is very good in differentiating pyogenic anaerobic and aerobic abscesses. And to me, fact, you demyelination, you should do a metabolite map. You can see that the central area of necrosis will show the maximum lactate, and the peripheral area will show the maximum choline. So this has got an eccentric, uh, uh, un incomplete ring, which is enhancing. Also, you can look at the glutamate, which will be high, which is in comparison to a low-grade gliomas, which may be a differential diagnosis, or a high-grade gliomas, which may be a differential diagnosis. The glutamate is high. The choline will be high in the periphery. Choline will be extremely low. Lactate will be extremely high in the center, and this is uh, even without that with the incomplete ring, most of the radiologists will diagnose as a semi-factor demyelination. Medulloblastomas, again, 1.5 Tesla has got a limitation, but you can see the very high choline, almost absent in A, and a taurine, which is actually at 3.4. It will be very difficult to differentiate between 3.56 uh, uh, minus it all and a taurine, and uh, for probably in a 3T, you can actually differentiate. Pediatric fMRI is a challenge, as we have already discussed, and we need to optimize their paradigms and uh, the uh, also, uh, another uh, important research we are actually conducting both in SICKIDS as well as in uh, Srijitra is that looking at the cerebrovascular reactivity maps for revascularization in Moya Moya disease in these children. So just I've shown you some cases just to tell you that it's not very complete. The children are not just tiny adults. They need a different strategy. You made them right from starting the, the, the selecting the sequence and optimizing the sequence and limiting the time. Thank you very much.